On New Year's Eve 1993, a German radio station bid farewell to its listeners. It was one of Berlin's oldest and most popular stations, sharing in the history of its city and helping to shape it like no other. Here is Rias Berlin, eine freie Stimme der freien Welt. The defeated Berlin. The city had been destroyed and divided into sectors by the victors. It had no gas, electricity or communications. After nearly a year of economic and political chaos, the Americans announced the founding of a new radio station, Drahtfunk im amerikanischen Sektor, or Dias. At first, only a few could receive it over still intact telephone lines. Under American authority, a handful of young journalists began reporting from inside Berlin. They had names like Drexel, Graf or Luft, and they had one thing in common. They hadn't been Nazis and weren't communists. The opening lines from their first broadcast on February 7th, 1946. But the Americans had worries. The Soviet-controlled Berliner Rundfunk, or Berlin Radio, had come increasingly under the influence of the communists. One thing had become clear since the first free elections in the fall of 46. The Soviet Union was trying to bring the entire city under its control, despite the defeat of the German communists at the polls. The Western powers were well aware that Stalin wasn't interested in freedom or democracy. The disbanding of the city government and interference with Rias reporters were proof. The radio station in the American sector could now be received by antenna. And for Rias, truth was reality, especially in the world of politics. Die Antwort lag wie bisher in Helmstedt, wo man noch immer auf Überwindung der schon berühmt gewordenen technischen Schwierigkeiten The war. airlift in 48, sponsored by the Western powers, checkmated the Russian attempt to starve out West Berlin by blockading its supply lines. Rios's coverage became part of the unprecedented campaign. Through Rios, the West Berliners found out where, when, how, and above all, from whom they were getting their supplies. A free voice of the free world, energetically making itself heard through loudspeakers if necessary, in the event of a power failure. In diesen kritischen Tagen, wo es um sein oder nicht sein von 2,2 Millionen Berlinern geht, hat sich Rias die Berliner Hörerschaft und die Hörerschaft der Ostzone im Sturm erobert. As a gesture of solidarity, the people of the United States honored the West Berliners with a bell after the ending of the blockade, a Liberty Bell. It was placed in the city hall of Berlin's Schöneberg district. Nobody knew it at the time, but this was to become the seat of the mayor for the next 40 years. At the request of Rias, Ernst Reuter, the mayor of the western half of the divided city, said a few words on tape about fundamentals. Rias became the most important source of information for the eastern sector of the city and the surrounding area. Without Rias, they would have been completely at the mercy of the propaganda from the SED, the East German Socialist Unity Party. But the high level of credibility enjoyed by the station soon put it in an uncomfortable position. It was 1953. Stalin was dead and East Berlin construction workers were demonstrating against wage cuts and for free elections. The situation escalated into a popular uprising against the East German regime. The free voice was supposed to become the voice of resistance. As long as the communists were in power, they insisted that Rias had instigated, coordinated and lost the uprising on the 17th of June. But on the contrary, the voice was at its most careful and level-headed during this period. The American administrators worried that one false word from their station would cause the Russian tanks to come rolling across Potsdamer Platz into the western sectors. War because of Rias? Even that might have been more bearable than this. Rias, das ist das perverse Ausrufungszeichen hinter deutscher Charakterlosigkeit. Rias, das ist etwas, wovon in wenigen Wochen niemand mehr sprechen wird. Das ist etwas, worüber der nutzlose Wind hinweg wehen wird, so als habe er den Staub der Gosse Not so. Rias remained the station of this divided city, with all the variety a listener could want, in the East and the West. It developed and produced shows which all of Berlin talked about. And included in its offerings were hit parades, adaptations from the American way of life. Rias reached out beyond the anonymity of the broadcasting building to make direct contact with its listeners. 
One of the rendezvous points was the Waldbühne, an auditorium seating 20,000 people, perfect for concerts, matinees and children's shows. In the nursery, the antidote to Marx and Lenin was Tobias, a radio character played by Fritz Genschow. At least on Sundays, he was the favorite uncle of an entire post-war generation. Rias gegen Berliner Rundfunk. Wir haben 16 0 gewonnen. Hansen Rosenthal spielte beim Berliner Rundfunk. Wir haben den Laden voll gekriegt. Das war also ganz schlimm. A dramatization of an interview with Hans Hensien Rosenthal, probably the most ingenious MC of the coming decades. The young Jewish Berliner, who barely survived the Nazi regime in hiding, completely redefined the concept of radio entertainment. With his cabarets and game shows, which were as intelligent as they were entertaining, he bound together an audience transcending all political and generational boundaries. He was one of the very first programming directors, and he maintained his commitment to Rias, even though television later offered him a national stage. After his untimely death, Rias and the Berliners finally found a way to thank him for his loyalty. A jump forward to the year 1993. This previously unnamed square in front of the Rias building is christened in his name. Back to the Cold War of the 1950s, author and composer Günther Neumann created a radio cabaret. In reference to West Berlin's situation, it was called The Islanders. The show became one of Rias most popular programs. With cutting and at times vicious punchlines, it turned the city's schizophrenic situation into liberating laughter. The theme song to the show became the city's anthem. In November 1958, Khrushchev came to East Berlin. He informed his communist vassals that he would give the Western Allies an ultimatum, demanding they leave Berlin. Regardless of what may have been hidden behind the phrase the free city of West Berlin, the Soviets were afraid of a capitalist window in the middle of East Germany and wanted it shut. West Berlin remained unchanged. The city was a magnet attracting hundreds of thousands of East Germans who came, saw, heard and stayed. Over three million people fled East Germany, causing SED party chief Walter Ulbricht to tell the biggest and shortest lie of the German post-war era. As the world waited with bated breath on August 13, 1961, Rias changed its programming overnight. Its exclusive subject was the construction of the wall, 24 hours a day. The socialist powers wanted to isolate West Berlin and its free voice, not only physically, but also acoustically. They installed frequency jamming transmitters. At that moment, nothing was more dangerous to Ulbricht than the whole truth about his nearly bankrupt country. Thanks to Rias, it was precisely this truth which became known, not only in Berlin, but all over East Germany. Institution. 